the page. It says the cleansing of the temple. In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah and entered upon his work. The, the courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with the tumult of unholy traffic, represented all too truly the temple of the heart, defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. In the cleansing in cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lusts, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. Notice what she then quotes. The Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. And he shall set as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver. Not only do we have two temple cleansings in the history of Christ, in the history of the Millerites, in the history of the 144,000. But another illustration of the cleansing of the temple is when the messenger of the covenant suddenly comes to his temple in Malachi. That is, it needs to be noted, particularly when you're going to deal with the 2520 time prophecy. Now notice Great Controversy 426. We looked briefly here this evening at Daniel 713 just to make a small point that Prophetically, the Lord did come in the clouds in the Millerite history based upon Daniel 7.13 when he came to the ancient days. At the beginning of the judgment, Christ came in the clouds. Now notice what she says here concerning October 22, 1844. The coming of Christ as our high priest to the most holy place for the cleansing of the sanctuary brought to view in Daniel 8.14. The coming of the Son of Man to the ancient of days as presented in Daniel 7.13. The coming of the Lord to his temple foretold by Malachi are descriptions of what? The same event. And this is also represented <clears throat> by the coming of the bridegroom to the marriage described by Christ in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. Sister White here is tying together four prophecies. Malachi, Matthew 25, Daniel 8.14, Daniel 7.13 and saying they're all fulfilled right here. And... In the parable of the ten virgins, you had the closing of the door right here. And in Malachi, you have the, the temple being cleansed right here. Um, so, uh, in, you have the quote I've referred to a couple times, once even tonight. 1842 is the quote where the door closed here. There's two doors closed in this Millerite history. Um, but at the end of the world... The door that closes here in 1842 closed on the Protestants. The door that closed on October 22nd, 1844, it closed on the Millerites. Okay, but at the end of the world, even though this history is going to be repeated, there's some differences. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, in prophecy, what you need to look for is if the way marks are all lined up correctly. But the way marks may be different. Okay? The, the, the important proof text for bringing line upon line is that the way marks are in the same sequence, the same order, but those way marks can be totally different. I mean, I mean, Elijah, right? Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah. So Jesus is saying those are two lines of prophecy that are identical, and they are. They're identical. But did they want to arrest Elijah? Yes. Did they arrest Elijah? No. Did they want to arrest John the Baptist? Yes. Did they arrest John the Baptist. Yes. Did Elijah die? No. Did John the Baptist die? Yes. But they're the same way mark. Okay. So when it comes to way marks, that's what's important. But they may be different. And the Millerite history, the door closes for those outside of the Millerites first and then for the Millerites second. But at the end of the world, 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come that judgments, judgment, judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? So when we get to the end of the world, we'll have two doors closed, two temple cleansings, two manifestations of the power of God. But the door is going to close first on Adventism, and then second on those people outside of Adventism. And that, that's how we understand it in Adventism. That's not challenging any typical Adventist understanding, but we usually don't put it into such a specific line as we're doing here. And it, it makes a difference when you do. So, the first door at the end of the world, it says, 
Revelation 18, 14, the first door closes in Revelation 18, verse 4, when the call is, come out of her, my people. And the second door closes down here in verse 21 of Revelation 18, when the stone is thrown into the Euphrates, marking the end of Babylon. Um, but where the door closes is not... It's the conclusion of the fleeing from the temple. But the reason that they flee from the temple is there's a manifestation of the power of God that precedes the closing of the door. The manifestation of the power of God in Revelation 18 is when the mighty angel comes down of, out of heaven in verse 1 and the earth is lightened with his glory. And when you get to verse 4, the Sunday law in the United States, the door closes on Adventism. And when the door closes on Adventism, then the Adventist church has been purified. The wheat and tares has been separated. There's another manifestation of the power of God as the Holy Spirit's poured out without measure. And then the door closes when Michael stands up and human probation closes. Um, now the next quote, a long quote from Great Controversy, I'm not going to, I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to, I'm going to, if you, if you stay on page 7, under 1844, the quote I did read from Great Controversy where she says, Daniel 8, 14, Daniel 7, 13, Malachi, and Matthew 25 are the same event. Okay, in, in this long quote uh, th that begins at the bottom of page 7 from under the subtitle Malachi 3 from the Great Controversy, page 424 and 425, she talks about Malachi once again because Malachi 3, when the messenger of the covenant suddenly comes to his temple, this was fulfilled on October 22, 1844. This is another, it's the same event. And it was fulfilled in the Millerite history. But in this passage, she, she tells us it's fulfilled again in Adventism. Um, and if you look to the second to the last paragraph from that quote, I'm on page 8. I'm not on the final paragraph from Great Controversy 424. I'm on the paragraph before the end. And I'm going to just read the last sentence from that paragraph. What she's saying is, that Malachi 3 was fulfilled in 1844 when the messenger of the covenant suddenly come to his temple and it represents a purification that takes place in this history. There was a purification process that prepared the Millerites to move by faith into the most holy place and the purification process precedes the closing of the door. But she says there's going to be a purification process represented by Malachi 3 here at the end of the world. In the last sentence from the second paragraph from the end it says while the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon, the, upon earth. This work is more clearly presented than the messages of Revelation 14. And if you read the entire passage, you'll see that she's putting it in the context of Malachi and the messenger of the covenant. I'm putting that in there because she's placing the, the fulfillment of Malachi in the Millerite history and she's placing it in the history of the 144,000. We may deal with that a little bit more this week, but we really have a lot of room, a lot of ground to cover. The bottom of the page, so, so we can really have this in our head, the Sunday Law. Many who have known the truth have corrupted their way before God. Who is it that knows the truth? Seventh-day Adventists. Many who have known the truth have corrupted their way before God and have departed from the faith. The, bro their, the broken ranks will be filled up by those represented by Christ as coming in at the eleventh hour. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is the time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will the, look, the Lord look upon them. His hand of mercy, his heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not em enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. This is the Sunday law. John 10.16 And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Lot's descendants. Lot is an illustration of the end of the world. All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world. And Christ said that uh, the story of Sodom is the story of the end of the world. And in early writings, page 278, she says, Servants of God, endowed with power from on high, with their face lighted up, and shining with holy consecration, went forth to proclaim the message from heaven. Souls that were scattered all through the religious bodies answered to the call, and the precious were hurried out of the doomed churches as Lot was hurried out of Sodom before her destruction. In verse 4 of Revelation 18, the call goes, Come out of her, my people. 
For in those that believe not the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness shall be left to receive strong delusion and to believe a lie. Then the light of truth will shine upon all who all whose hearts are open to receive it and all the children of the Lord that remain in Babylon will heed the call. Come out of her, my people. There are diligent students of the word of prophecy in all parts of the world who are obtaining light and still greater light from searching the scriptures. And this is true of all nations, of all tribes, and all people. These will come from the grossest air and will take the places of those who have had opportunities and privileges and have not prized them. These have worked out their own salvation with fear and trembling unless they become deficient in doing the ways and wills of God. While those who have had great light have, through perversity of their own natural hearts, turned away from Christ because displeased with the requirements. But God will not be left without witness. The one-hour laborers will be brought in at the eleventh hour and will consecrate ability and all their entrusted means to advance the work. These will receive the war reward for their faithfulness because they are true to principle and shun not their duty to declare the whole out counsel of God. When those who have had abundance of light throw off the restraint which the word of God imposes and make void as law, others will come in to fill their place and take their crown. Great is the work of the Lord. Men are choosing sides. Even those supposed to be heathen will choose the side of Christ. While those who become offended, as did the disciples, who will go away and walk no more with him. And others will come in and occupy the place they have left vacant. The time is very near when man shall have been, reached the prescribed limits. The record of their works in the books of heaven is weighed in the balances and found wanting. Where do we get that term from? Daniel chapter 5, the handwriting on the wall. Okay. She's, she's talking about the transition when, when Adventists are going to go out. Not all Adventists, but the Adventists that go out they're going to be weighed in the balances and found wanting and at that time those people outside of Adventism are going to come stand with Adventism this is at the Sunday law <clears throat> but remember in this time period what happens to those of us that are not living up to the light in our judgment we're going to be weighed in the balances and found wanting okay this this is this is one of the main places we're going to in this study this week all right because you can show from prophecy right now this is what we're going to try showing this week. Is that the handwriting is on the wall for Seventh-day Adventists. And I don't mean in a metaphorical way. I mean in a direct, specific, prophetic way. The handwriting is on the wall. Um, okay. The Sunday Law... The Sunday law is where the door closes. Do you see that? Okay, if you see that, say amen. amen. All right. Because in each of these histories, there are three tests. We started it that way tonight. These, are, these three way marks are also three tests. They're also the three-step work of the Holy Spirit. They are many things. But one line that they are is that they're three tests. And the third test is where the door closes. Okay, the third test for the Millerites, you had the door closed in the parable of the ten virgins. You had the door closed into the holy place. One of the prophetic characteristics of the third way mark, the third test, is that's where the door closes. So where does the door close on Adventism? The Sunday law. So what test is the Sunday law for Adventism? It's the third test. All right. Disregard the history up here. Don't be thinking Miller, right? Now just, just to think about us at the end of the world because we know this history is going to be repeated, right? For us at the end of the world, our third test is where the door closes and the door closes at the Sunday Law. So our third test, the Seventh-day Adventist, is the Sunday Law test. Now, at the Sunday Law, you or I, if we're alive at the Sunday Law, Seventh-day Adventist, we, we are, only two things can happen to us. What are the two things? You either get the mark of the beast or the seal of God. If I get the mark of the beast, is that permanent? Yep. If I get the seal of God, is that permanent? Yes. So in that sense, at the Sunday law, probation closes for Seventh-day Adventists, right? right? Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so it's at the Sunday law. It's at the third test where probation closes. Amen? Amen. You see the logic? Uh, yeah, are you willing to stand with that logic? Okay, because inspiration identifies a test that comes before probation closes, and it's the second test. All right? Under the second test, from 1880 Materials, page 701. 
she's, she's dealing with Anna Phillips, false prophet. Several times during our conversation in which you became very much er in earnest, you repeated the sentence, O oh, consistency, thou art a jewel. I repeat the same with decided force to you. You say that Anna Visions placed the forming of the image of the beast after probation closes. Brothers and sisters, there's only one definition of the image of the beast in inspiration. The image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. She expresses it a variety of ways, but there's only one definition of the image of the beast in inspiration. And the image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the situation. The mark of the beast is the mark of Rome's authority. It's closely related to the image of the beast, but it's different. Okay, the image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. I repeat, you say that Anna Visions placed the formation of the image of the beast after probation closes. Or you could say, you say that Anna's visions teach that church and state come together after probation closes because the combination of church and state is the image of the beast. You say that Anna Visions placed the forming of the image of the beast after probation closes. This is not so. You claim to believe the testimonies. Let them set you right on this point. The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. When does probation close? At the Sunday law. The image of the beast will be formed before probation closes. Be for it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. There's a test that comes before the Sunday law, which is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. And that test is the test concerning the image of the beast. Hmm. For it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. Your position is such a jumble of inconsistencies that but few will be inconsistencies that but few will be deceived. In Revelation 13, the subject is plainly presented. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Then the miracle working power is revealed, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. She quotes some more of Revelation 13 and then in the next paragraph she says, this is the test the people of God must have before they are sealed. Brothers and sisters, when do we receive the seal of God? At the Sunday law. There's a test, the image of the beast test. It comes before probation closes at the Sunday law and it comes before we're sealed. There's always three tests in each of these histories. So even if this is a new concept for you, you should at least be open enough to, to see, yeah, well, there is going to be three tests. So I might know, understand what he's saying about the image of the beast test, but Sister White's the one that's saying it's a, a test that comes before probation closes and it's a test we must pass before we're sealed. Now notice from testimonies, Volume 9, page 395. Foreign nations will follow the example of the United States, though she leads out, yet the same crisis will come upon all our people on all parts of the world. The Sunday law first comes to the United States. Okay? The next, the next quote on the bottom of the page is Revelation 13, 11. It says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. Who's that beast? United States. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. <clears throat> when does the United States speak as a dragon? At the Sunday law, right? Okay? So when the United States speaks as a dragon, that's the mark of the beast. Okay? It's Great Controversy 442. The speaking of a nation, of the nation, is the action of his le legislative and judicial authorities. Sunday law is going to come through Congress, is it not? Yep. And, and when it does, that's the speaking as a dragon of the United States. The mark of the beast has arrived. Testimonies, Volume 5, page 214 to through 216. Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spider stain upon them. It is left with us to remedy the defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement. Then the latter rain will fall upon us as the early rain fell upon the di disciples on the day of Pentecost. This is often misunderstood. Did, did anybody you had time to read the the handout on the latter rain that we handed out last night? Some of it. Okay, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. At Pentecost, 
in the history of Christ at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out without measure. And at the Sunday law, when the church is purified, the wheat and tares are separated, and those that receive the seal of God are no longer in connection with those that receive the mark of the beast, then the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure. But before Pentecost, before Pentecost, the latter rain was sprinkling. See, there's a sprinkling of the latter rain that comes before Pentecost. If you have an Ellen White study Bible, I um, hope I can turn right to it because I wasn't planning to go there. John 21. Twenty-one verse. Uh, what are you taking me to, John? Twenty-one verse twenty-two for. Okay. Yeah. John twenty-two. Okay. In John twenty. 20 verse 22 it says and when he had said this he breathed upon them and said unto them receive ye the Holy Ghost Sister White in the Ellen White Study Bible comments on when Christ breathed upon them and this is from Spirit of Prophecy volume 2 page 243 the act of Christ in breathing upon his disciples the Holy Ghost in imparting his peace to them was as a few drops before the plentiful shower to be given on the day of Pentecost before the Holy Spirit is poured out without measure at the Sunday law where the church is purified the latter rain begins to sprinkle okay so don't confuse this quote in Testimonies volume 5 she's not disagreeing with herself she knows that it was poured out fully at Pentecost but she's not denying that there's a sprinkling that takes place before the Sunday law latter rain begins to sprinkle before the Sunday law Back to Testimonies, Volume 5. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of preparation? Those who are united with the world are receiving the worldly mold and preparing for the mark of the beast. Those who are distrustful of self, who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls by obeying the truth, these are receiving the heavenly mold and preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. When the decree goes forth, what's the decree? The Sunday law. When the Sunday law goes forth, the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. Probation closes at the Sunday law for Seventh-day Adventists. If you receive this, the seal of God at the Sunday law, your character is set for eternity and vice versa. If you receive the mark of the beast, your character is set for eternity and there's a test before probation closes. Before you receive the seal of God because you receive the seal of God at the Sunday law by which your eternal destiny will be decided and it's the image of the beast test. It's a, it's a test. It's a visual test. Seventh-day Adventists are going to have to recognize just before the Sunday law, they're going to have to recognize that church and state are coming together in the United States. Because you know as a seven-day Adventist, when that reaches its final fruition, its final climax, they're going to enforce the mark of the beast. They're going to speak as a dragon. Where, if this is the Sunday law where the door closes, if this is the Sunday law where the door closes, where do we get the close of the door as an illustration of the close of probation? upon the rule of first mention in the Bible where do we get the closing of a door as an illustration of the close of probation Noah's Ark Noah's Ark is illustrating where the door closes because all these histories are the same All right, Noah's Ark is the, the door closing on the Ark is the third test in his generation but there's a visual test that precedes the third test the third test is where the door closes the second test is a visual test it's something that demands that you see what's happening you need to see that church and state are coming together because it's telling you as a seventh day adventist your probation is about to close so in Noah's ark the door closes at the third test was probation still open when the animals were getting on the ark yes. they had a visual warning didn't they and we have a visual warning too and our visual warning is to recognize that the image of the beast is coming together in the United States. Let me, let me go with you now to Revelation thir uh, 13. <clears throat> We've already agreed, I hope. Does anyone disagree that in verse 11 of Revelation 13 when the United States speaks that that's the Sunday law in the United States? Everyone understands that, right? I mean, Sister White plainly says it. That's, that's the Sunday law. But at the same time, 
The image of the beast is fully developed in the United States because see the, the, the mark of the beast that's a, a singular point in time. When the mark of the beast arrives, let's say it arrives on January 31st, 2010. It arrives on that day. Singular point in time. But the image of the beast, the coming together of church and state, this is a process that covers a whole period of time. But the process is complete when they pass the Sunday law. When the church is so controlling the civil structure of the United States that it has the ability to pass the Sunday law, then the image of the beast has reached its fullest maturity. It can speak as a dragon, right? Sister White bears this out, but you follow the logic there? So let me ask you a question. How many images of the beast are there in Revelation 13? There's two. There's two. There's two. Now the first one, the first one, we know it because the spirit of prophecy tells us what it is. In Revelation 13 verse 11, when the United States speaks as a dragon, you have the mark of the beast being enforced, but at the same time, you know the image of the beast has been formed in the United States because the Protestant churches in the United States have reached the point where they can control the government of the United States. So you know it's there, even though it's not specifically identified. At that point, the United States is fully disconnected from righteousness. National apostasy is followed by national ruin. The United States begins to fully fulfill its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy. And verse 12 of Revelation 13 says, And he, the United States, exercise all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them to dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. See, the people in the United States, they've already passed the Sunday law. Now the United States is going to go to the whole world. And that's what sister, we read the quote. Sister White says on page 11, As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy in forcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. It begins in the United States, Revelation 13:11. Then the United States, fully disconnected from righteousness, it's going to go out and it's going to deceive the world. Verse 13, And he, the United States, doeth wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth inside of men. Now, brothers and sisters, Sister White says that it's Satan that brings fire down out of heaven. And I just said it was the United States, but it's both. Okay, Sister White says that the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist of Bible prophecy, and she says that Satan's the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. They're interchangeable terms, so don't, don't stumble over that. that. Satan is using the United States to deceive the world at this point in time, so it's... So it's a mutual affair. But notice verse 14. And the United States deceiveth them that dwell, on, that dwell in Canada. Is that what it says? Dwell on the earth. By the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, saying to the whole world that they should do what? There's only one definition of the image of the beast. It's the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. Revelation 17.17 17 tells the same story. The ten kings, the civil authorities in Revelation 17 are going to agree to give their civil authority to the papacy. In Revelation 17.17, 17, that's what's happening here in verse 14. The United States is going to force the world to come under the authority of the United Nations, the ten kings, with the Pope of Rome as the moral authority in that arrangement. That's the combination of church and state with the church and controller relationship. Have you, have you read the recent encyclical from the Pope of Rome? Do you see that he's, he's getting ready to employ the United Nations to do what he wants to do? Who's going to make the world accept that arrangement? The United States, the false prophet. The United Nations is the dragon. Testimonies to ministers, page 38. Sister White says, Kings, governors, and rulers have taken upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes forth to make war with the saints. The dragon power at the end of the world is a group of politicians, kings, governors, and rulers. And the group of politicians at the end of the world that is the civil authority is the one world government that we know as the United Nations. And they're the ten kings of Revelation 17 that agree to give their civil structure over to the beast of Bible prophecy, the papacy. And they do so because the false prophet, the United States, deceives the whole world into doing that. So in verse 14 of Revelation 13 it says, And the United States de deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image of the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. And if you don't think that this is a one world government, then notice the next verse. And he had power, the United States, to give life unto the image of the beast. The United States had power 
to enforce the combination of church and state that takes place between the United Nations and the papacy that the image of the beast should both what? Top of page 11. The speaking of the nation is the action of a legislative and judicial authorities. If it's going to speak, whenever this image of the beast speaks, it's going to speak to the whole world. And in order to speak, it has to have a legislative and judicial body. Does the, do the United Nations have a legislative body? New York City. Does it have a judicial body? Holland. All right. Holland. The Hague. That's where the World Court is, if you don't know. The World Court that's managed by the United Nations is in Holland. That's the judicial branch of the United Nations. The legislative branches in New York City. On page 11, under distinction, it says, The image of the beast represents that form of apostate Protestantism which will be developed when the Protestant churches shall seek the aid of the civil power for the enforcement of their dogmas. The mark of the beast still remains to be defined. Sister White knows there's a difference between the image of the beast and the mark of the beast. The image of the beast is the combination of church and state with the church in control of the relationship. And the mark of the beast is Sunday enforcement. Now notice the next quote from Great Controversy 448. The enforcement of Sunday keeping on the part of the Protestant churches is an enforcement of the worship of the papacy of the beast. Those who understanding the claims of the fourth commandment choose to observe a f the false instead of the true Sabbath are thereby paying homage to the power by which alone it is commanded. But in the very act of enforcing a religious duty by secular power, the churches themselves would do what? Form an image of the beast. Hence, the enforcement of Sunday keeping in the United States would be an enforcement of the worship of the beast in his image. When the United States speaks as a dragon in Revelation 13, 11, the image of the beast is fully developed in the United States. Then the United States is disconnected from righteousness and it goes to the whole world and says, we need to come under the authority of this one world government. Why? Why does the world accept that? Well, Bible prophecy tells us why. Because the world in this time period is going to be brought to its knees by the seventh trumpet, the third woe. And the seventh trumpet and the third woe, if you maintain the foundational understanding that's represented on the 1843 and the 1850 chart, the seventh trumpet and the third woe is none other than radical Islam. You think maybe radical Islam is on the verge of bringing the world to its knees? Did you, did you hear what OPEC did here recently? Just determined that they're not going to sell oil with the dollar bill anymore. They're going to switch it to some other, to the euro or some other form of currency. You know what happens when that, when that takes place? The dollar's going through the basement. Okay. But that's Islam. OPEC. OPEC. That's Islam. What, what happens if they go in and they, they clean up Iran's nuclear plants? Well, even, even if it doesn't ca cause an all-out war, it's going to send petroleum prices through the roof, right? What's that do to the economy? See, Islam is the one that creates the crisis that allows the United States to go to the world and say, we need to bring the world under a one world government in order to deal with radical Islam. And that can be soundly demonstrated from Bible prophecy for those that wish to see. Okay? Um, that's the second test. The third test is where the door closes for at the end of the world. It's Sunday law. That's where the door closes for Seventh-day Adventists. You were agreeing to it before you knew I was setting you up with, on these three tests. But the second test, which is more less unfamiliar, less familiar to Adventists, Adventists, is a visual test that takes place before the door closes. Sister White says, the Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before probation closes, for it is the great test for the people of God by which their eternal destiny will be decided. This is the test they must pass before they are sealed. The image of the beast test is the test, the second test that comes before the door closes at the third test of the Sunday law. And the first test says one thing is certain. I'm on page 12 under the first test. One thing is certain. Those Seventh-day Adventists who take their stand under Satan's banner will first. Where do Seventh-day Adventists take their stand under Satan's banner? at the Sunday law. 
One thing is certain, no Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world that receive the mark of the beast, that take their, their stand under Satan's banner, they will first give up their confidence in the testimonies of God's Spirit. And in the terminology of Ellen White, that means the first test for Adventism is the spirit of prophecy. And it's the way it always enters each of these, each of these movements. There's a human being that is a reformer, whether it's Noah or Moses or Elijah or John the Baptist or William Miller. The reformer for us at the end of the world is Ellen White. And if we reject Ellen White, brothers and sisters, if you want to understand how church and state come together in the United States, you can. I, uh, you could figure it out from the Bible. But as a Seventh-day Adventist, you know full well that there's much more light about how church and state comes together in the United States in the writings of Ellen White. So if you're down here in this time period as a Seventh-day Adventist determining whether you agree with the spirit of prophecy or not, and you decide that you don't have any regard for the spirit of prophecy, you just flunk the first test. You just throw away your intellectual point of reference to recognize the second test. So the third test takes you totally by surprise, and we're going to show in a minute, Lord willing, that these tests are progressive in nature, and if you flunk the first test, you're not involved with the second, and on and on. And the first test for Seventh-day Adventists is the authority of the spirit of prophecy. You know in the last general conference session that they passed a resolution when no one was around. Don't you? You know what it says? The first page praises Sister White and the last paragraph says but her writings are not supposed to be are not to be used in and this is their words faith or practice. What does that mean? That's a resolution in the last general conference session. I'm not guessing. I, I have it. I've printed it in a newsletter. Nobody really paid attention to it. But what does it mean that we can't use the spirit of prophecy in regards to faith and practice? <laughs> what does that mean? It means, brothers and sisters, I think we're making a wrong choice here on our first test. What does Sister White says? The last deception of Satan is to what? Make of none effect. The spirit of prophecy. You realize you're at the end of the world? I realize I'm at the end of the world. So the last deception of Satan should be here, right? Brothers and sisters, I know, I know that the majority of Seventh-day Adventists that hear what, I, what I'm sharing about prophecy, they'll end up trying to figure out how to expose me as a heretic or this, that, or the other. They're not going to receive this message. I understand that. I've been doing this a long time. And invariably, when I say something like I just said, those type of listeners are going to say, he's criticizing the church, he's attacking the leadership and all this, that, and the other. I'm, I'm, I'm really not. I'm opening up the prophetic word. To be forewarned is to be prepared. We're walking in the footsteps of ancient Israel. And God's people did not receive the message then. And that history is being repeated. And we need to be wise, not foolish virgins. Notice the Desire of Ages 7.99. It is the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam even to the closing scenes of time. That means it was the voice of Christ that was speaking through the writings of Sister White. And it has the same authority as the writings of the Bible. In ancient times, God spoke to men by the mouth of prophets and apostles. In these days, he speaks to them by the testimonies of his spirit. In these days, he speaks to them through the spirit of prophecy. But she goes on. There was never a time when God instructed his people more earnestly than he instructs them now concerning his will and the course he would have them pursue. But she's putting an emphasis on her writings that you don't get away with putting that kind of emphasis on her writings in Adventism anymore. She's saying her writings are conveying the most earnest message from Christ to his people of all time. Wow. Three tests. Matthew 4, 1, then Jesus was led up, led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. How many tests did Jesus have? That's right. Daniel 12, 10, speaking of the Millerite history and speaking of the history of the 144,000, it says, many shall be purified and made white and tried. There's always a threefold test. Now here's early writings, page 259. Okay. Uh, 
I'm not going to read it. You have it, you have it in front of you. I have, I have to move to the next point. I'm going to tell you what it says. I already told you once. I'll tell you again. She, she talks about the history of Christ, all right? And she says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. She compares John the Baptist with William Miller. So John represents the first test in the history of Christ. The next sentence says, those who flunked, those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of Jesus. They flunked this first test, so they're not going to be involved with the second test. Okay? Uh, and, and Satan led on those who rejected John to go stir, still further and reject and crucify Christ. They placed themselves where they could not receive the blessing on the day of Pentecost. Okay? Threefold test in the time of Christ. And the next paragraph, she says this. And I'm going to start in the third sentence of the next paragraph. It says, All heaven watched the deepest interest of the first angel's message. But many who professed to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And by rejecting the two former messages, they have so darkened their understanding that they can see no light in the third angel's message. In these histories of reform movements, there are three tests. If you don't pass the first test, you're not involved with the second test. But if you do pass the first test, you can still flunk the second test. But if you pass the first two tests, then you have a chance for the third test that you can flunk that one too. That's where we started tonight. There were some people that went through and then flunked the third test. This history is repeated at the end of the world. At the bottom of page 13, Sister White's talking about the three angels' messages and the, the part in that paragraph that's in boldface. She says, there cannot be a third without a first and a second. You can't have a third angel's message if you don't have a first and a second because they're cause and effect. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to put one more truth about these three messages in place and we'll be done. Okay? The first message is a warning message. Did William Miller proclaim a warning message? Did John the Baptist... Did Noah, did Moses, did Elijah? The first waymark is a warning message. The second waymark is where the door, clo the, the door closes here in this history um, against this message. So let's put message rejected. All right. What message? The first message. Isn't that, isn't that the case in... In Millerite history, the warning message comes this way, but in June of 1842, the Protestants reject the first angel's message, right? Then, after it's rejected, there comes a divine pronouncement. And the divine pronouncement is identifying that the warning message has been rejected. The Protestants close their door in June of 1842, and then the pronouncement comes in the summer of 1844. The divine pronouncement, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That's the divine pronouncement that the warning message has been rejected. And that leads to judgment. Okay? On the testimony of two or three, a thing is established. Let me show you this a couple times. On um, page 14, under Nimrod's warning message. Who's Nimrod? He's the one that built Babel. What's Babel? Babel's a type of Babylon, right? And in the summer of 1844, the divine pronouncement then was Babylon is fallen is fallen. So we know in the Millerite history, we've got a direct link to the story of Nimrod and the story of Belshazzar. Because in those two stories, that's where Babylon fell. And we know that at the end of the world, in Revelation 18, verse 2, it says Babylon is fallen is fallen. So we have a connection here in the 144,000 and in the Millerite history with the story of Nimrod and the story of Belshazzar. Follow me? Okay. Under Nimrod's warning message from patriarchs and prophets, I won't read it. You can read it on your own because I'm running out of time. Sister White says that Nimrod was given a warning message. It was, it was, that generation was given a warning message and it came from Noah and Shem. Okay, you can read it there. That was the warning message. That's this here. Okay. 
And then Nimrod's divine pronouncement is in Genesis 11, 5, and 6. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. This is the divine pronouncement here that Nimrod and them, there's no restraint on them. And the, what the, how the Lord identifies that they've crossed the line is he says that anything they imagine to do now, they're going to do. And he's drawing that from the story of the flood. Because when the antediluvians crossed the line, what does the story of the flood tell us? That their imagination was evil continually. So Nimrod and his cohorts, they've reached the same condition. They're not turning back. That was the divine pronouncement. Nimrod's judgment was, verse 7 through 9, Go to, let us go down, and therefore confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence the Lord did scatter them abroad on the face of the earth. You can see Genesis 6, 5 through 7, what the reference to what imagination means. So well, what I want you to see here is in the story of Nimrod. There was a warning message to Nimrod from Noah and Shem. But Nimrod rejected the message and there came a divine pronouncement. Their imagination's going to go anywhere at once now. And then there was a judgment. They were scattered and their languages was confused. See the logic? Because this is, this is another line of truth that's in the three angels' message. It's in the history of the Millerites because William Miller delivered a warning message. It was rejected in 1842. There was a divine pronouncement. Babylon has fallen, directly tying us to the story of Nimrod. And it was followed by judgment. Okay, how about uh, next page? Belshazzar's divine pronouncement. Belshazzar's divine pronouncement, now we're looking at Belshazzar, is the handwriting on the wall. Many, many tekel you farsen. That's the divine pronouncement. And his warning message was the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, you can see this in Daniel 5, 8 through 18 through 24. When, when Belshazzar sees the handwriting on the wall, that's the divine pronouncement that you've cro- crossed the limits of God's mercy. Okay, that's the divine pronouncement. And, and Belshazzar begins to look around for someone to explain it to him. And who explains it to him? Daniel. And when Daniel comes in, Daniel, you can read it. You already know it, but you can read it. Daniel tells him the story of Nebuchadnezzar. He does not tell him the story of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 1, 2, or 3. He tells him the story of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4. Because the story of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 is the story of a king that gets a warning message. But he's lifted up in his pride and judgment is brought against him. And what was his judgment? He ate ate grass like an ox. He ate grass like an ox, but for how long did he eat? Seven years. How many days in that seven years? 2,520. Nebuchadnezzar's judgment was 2,520. Okay, but in any case, but in any case, Daniel, when he comes into Belshazzar, he he explains to Belshazzar, you had a warning message. And your warning message was the warning message that was illustrated in the history of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. But you rejected the message. Came the divine pronouncement, many, many, tekel you farson. And it says, in that very night, he was slain. Judgment followed. Right? Right? Okay. Notice on the bottom of page 15. Belshazzar, Belshazzar had been given many opportunities for knowing and doing the will of God. He had seen his grandfather Nebuchadnezzar banished from the society of men. He had seen the intellect in which the proud monarch glory taken away by the one who gave it. He had seen the king driven from his kingdom and made the companions made the companion of the beast of the field. But Belshazzar's love of amusement and self-glorification had faced the lessons he should never have forgotten and he committed sin similar to those that brought signal judgments on Nebuchadnezzar. He wasted the opportunities that he graciously granted him, neglecting to use the opportunities within his reach from becoming acquainted with truth. What must I do to be saved was a question that the great but foolish king passed by indifferently. So, 
we have set the stage. <laughs> we have set the stage to begin our studies tomorrow night. Um, I hope you can all make it back. Our, 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 I'm going to do the head count here. Are any of you certain you're not going to be here tomorrow night so we can make less handouts? Because I made too many. All right. Tomorrow night we're going to look at the 2520. And uh, let me let me tell you why the t why it will be interesting to look at, at the 2520. Number one. The Millerites believe the 2520 was a valid prophecy even if we don't believe it anymore. But as they understood the 2520, they understood that it represented the time that ancient Israel was scattered. And when, when ancient Israel was scattered among the heathen nations, if all of us here right now were gathered up and sent to Korea, how many of us in here could speak Korean? So, in the 2520, follow me on this. This is the point, a point I want to leave in your mind for tonight. In the 2520 time prophecy, the punishment against Israel is that they were scattered and there was confusion of languages. Okay? Because the punishment for Nimrod was confusion of languages and a scattering. Right? And the scattering is represented by the 2520. And... Belshazzar's handwriting on the wall. Many, many tekel you farsen. Daniel interpreted it, didn't he? But it's a little bit confused. There's confusion of language there. Why is there confusion of language in many, many tekel you farsen? <laughs> okay, he knows. Some of us know. I'm going to tell you why there is. Because it's grammar. Many, many tekel you farsen. And Daniel walks in and he gives the grammatical definition. Thou kingdom is divided, your weight in the balance isn't found wanting, right? But did you know that a many and a tekel and a yufarsin were also coins and measurements of weight in Babylon? And a many is a thousand, and a many is a thousand, and a tekel is twenty, and a yufarsin is five hundred, and many, many tekel and yufarsin is twenty-five twenty. Oh. oh. So the divine pronouncement against Belshazzar is the 2520 which is symbolic of the scattering which was the pronouncement against Nimrod the scattering and the confusion of languages and the pronouncement against Israel the scattering and the confusion of languages and the 2520 and there's we've set the stage where we could develop this now further shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for allowing us to consider these things here at this crisis point in earth's history. We ask for your continued influence through your Holy Spirit. We ask a continued blessing upon these meetings. We ask that you'd use these truths to awaken us fully from our Laodicean condition that we might understand the purpose you have for each of us individually and that we might set aside the idols that are preventing us from being fully used by you. We thank you for this opportunity. We ask that you take us home safely this evening, evening and give us a good night's rest. And we thank you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>